All right, so um, we are going to use now the, the differential equations that we developed from the force balance on a differential fluid volume um, to solve for the uh, fluid velocity profile between two flat plates, two infinite flat plates, um, where one of them is moving with a velocity v. Um, this is probably the simplest uh, problem to solve using Navier-Stokes, and it's called Couette flow. And we've used this several times throughout the semester. All right, so um, step one, what are the primary directions we care about? Well, this is our x direction, um, so we're going to care about the x direction of our fluid, okay? So uh, shear stress is going to be in that direction, any velocity, uh, uh, pressure gradients are going to be in the x direction, um, so we care about the obvious uh, the x direction for our force balance, which means we're going to use the x component of the Navier-Stokes equation. So let's write that out here real quick. We have, oh, we already have it written down. Never mind. Um, and now we're going to go about simplifying the Navier-Stokes equation. So um, one of the things we're going to assume steady state, since uh, for all we know, this top plate has been moving and will continue moving for all time. So we have no component on time here. That's equal to zero. Um, now we have an infinite plate in the x direction. So in the x direction, this plate continues to go on forever. Um, so while our u component of our velocity is not going to be zero, we do know that our u component of our velocity is not going to change in the x direction. It has no reason to change, right? If nothing changes in the x direction, then the velocity is not going to change in the x direction. So um, this is going to be equal to zero. Um, now, we, uh, we don't know that our v component of our velocity is zero yet, um, and we definitely know that du dy is not equal to zero because we know that at the top here, at y is equal to h, our velocity is u, and at the bottom it's equal to zero. So we can't cancel this out yet. Um, but we do know it's infinite in the z direction, into and out of the plane, and again, the same arguments for x apply. If it's infinite, then we have no change in u in the z direction, so that's equal to zero. Um, we have not mentioned a pressure gradient, so there, that's going to be equal to zero. We have no body force in the x direction. Uh, we haven't mentioned it, and it would likely be in the y direction, so it's, we're not going to include it in this force balance in the x direction. And um, well, for similar arguments we made over here, no change in the x direction, then the second derivative is certainly going to be zero if the first is always zero, and the same thing with the z direction. Um, so we need to, uh, we've reduced our dimensionality, check, by canceling out all of the things that don't change because of how we've simplified our problem, infinite flat plates, basically. Um, and now we're going to apply continuity. Remember continuity? Yeah. So uh, one of the things we're going to additionally assume is that our density is equal to a constant. And if we do that, the density can come out of all of these differentials, like this, and cancel out because it's we can just divide by row, and on the left right hand side is zero, so zero divided by row is still zero. Um, and what we get is du dx plus dv dy plus dw dz is equal to zero. But we know already from reducing our dimensionality that d dw dz is zero. Again, nothing's going to change in the z direction if it's infinite and homogeneous in that direction. Same with x. So what we're left with is dv dy is equal to zero, which tells us that v, if we integrate this, is equal to a constant. Um, we can solve for that constant if we look at our problem and we say, all right, what is the v component, the vertical component of our velocity, at a wall? So let's say at the bottom wall here, is our fluid going to be going through the wall? No, it can't. That's what makes it a wall. That's why we call it a wall. Otherwise, we drop, do a bunch of little dots and call it something porous. So our v component at, for example, y is equal to 0, v at y is equal to 0, um, v is equal to 0. Another way to write that is v at uh, y is equal to 0 is equal to 0. 
So if v at y is equal to zero is equal to zero, then v is equal to zero everywhere. And if v is equal to zero everywhere, we can cancel out this v, that's equal to zero. By the way, this is how all Navier-Stokes problems go. You literally are just trying to cross out as much stuff as possible until you can get a differential equation you can solve. And what we're left with is um, this, mu du squared dy squared is equal to zero. So we can cancel out our, our viscosity, which is really interesting. This tells us that our velocity profile is independent of the fluid that we have in there. We could have tar pitch, or we could have water, and the velocity, and the velocity profile is going to be the same. What changes, by the way, is how much force is going to be required to maintain that velocity. With tar pitch, it will be enormous. With water, it'll be relatively small. Um, but this is a differential equation you can solve, right? So if we solve it, we get du dy is equal to uh, well, if you um, sorry, if the way to think about how to solve these when you have the second order differential equations is to integrate this, um, in which case we have a d du dy is equal to zero, which becomes um, du dy is equal to a constant, c1. And then we can separate and integ integrate again. This time we're going to go uh, du integral of du is equal to integral of uh, c1 dy, and we get u is equal to c1y plus c2, which is the equation for a line. Um, great. So we've applied the details of our problem. Um, we've applied our bound. Now we got to apply our boundary conditions. And what boundary conditions do we know? Well, we know two boundary conditions. We know our velocity at zero is equal to zero, and our velocity at h is equal to u. Y is equal to h is equal to u. So u at y is equal to zero is equal to zero. So if we say that zero is equal to c1 times zero plus c2, we see that c2 has to equal zero. And if we solve for, sorry, u at y is equal to h is equal to, did I say v or capital U? Let's go look. I said capital U, okay. Um, is equal to capital U, then we have u, capital U, is equal to c1 times h, so c1 is equal to h, sorry, capital U over H. And if we write out our whole equation now, um, we get U, uh, sorry, U is equal to capital U over H times Y, or V, our velocity, if we write the Eulerian point of view, is equal to U over H Y I hat plus zero J hat plus zero K hat. And we're done. Well, we're done solving it. Um, and it's, it, this is how all Navier-Stokes equations go. We just reduce the dimensionality, apply continuity in order to, again, cancel something out because continuity tells us that usually it's an additional constraint on our system, right? And the problems we're going to give you usually means that one of the velocities is equal to zero. Then we apply the details of the problem to cancel out things like uh, pressure and uh, gravity. And finally, we integrate and apply the boundary conditions and we get a equation for our velocity profile, which if we were to draw it up here, um, would look like this. So we have, here's our axis, if we're drawing our u component of our velocity, it's zero at zero, it's equal to u up here and it's a linear velocity profile. So this is our velocity profile that we solved for using Navier-Stokes equation. Now that we have this velocity profile, we can apply some analysis to it. So the first question I'm going to ask you is, is this flow rotational? So we're going to ask, we're going to apply our equation for vorticity. So psi is equal to um, dw dy minus dv dz i hat plus du dz minus dw dx j hat plus dv dx plus oh, negative <laughs> du dy k hat. 
Uh, so the first thing we're going to notice is we can apply dimensionality to this as well. We know our V is zero, so it's not going to change. I'm going to change my color here. Um, w does not change. V does not change. U does not change with Z because it's infinite in that direction. W is zero everywhere, so it does not change. And all we're left with is this here. And in fact, V does not change, so all we're left with is that our vorticity is equal to negative du dy k hat, which is equal to negative u over h k hat. Remember, it has a direction. In this, in this case, it's going to be pointing into the page. Um, and you can see that it, indeed the flow does rotate. Um, one of the definitions or one of the ways of thinking about uh, whether or not flow is rotational is if you put a small plus sign into the flow, what would happen? Would it start rotating? And in this case, it would because the bottom of the, the plus sign is going at a slower velocity than the top. So as it moved along in the flow, it would slowly rotate more and more like this. It would rotate as it went along. Um, so it would tumble, right? And this uh, this equation basically proves that to us. Um, another thing to note is that um, if we had inviscid flow, uh, we would not have any rotation in this case. And it turns out rotational flow and inviscid flow are highly related. If you have inviscid, if you have, excuse me, if you have irrotational flow, that means it um, is inviscid as well. So what is the volume uh, metric dilatational rate. Is this an incompressible fluid? Is basically, or is the fluid expanding or contracting, which is what we're trying to figure out. So let's do 1 over delta V times dV dt. So this is our dilatational rate. They don't have a fancy symbol for it, so we just write it out. Is equal to du dx plus dV dy plus dW dz. Um, and now we uh, take the derivative of this and we v is equal to zero w is equal to zero and u is only a function of y if we go back up here u is only a function of y so this is equal to zero as well so our fluid is not expanding or contracting it is um, incompressible in this case or not comp yeah it's in it's behaving like an incompressible fluid that doesn't mean necessarily is we could have air in there and it air is a compressible fluid but it's um, behaving like an incompressible fluid because it's not changing its um, density. Uh, yeah, so that is uh, how we apply a uh, Navier-Stokes equation to a simple problem. And then analyze the result to see what kind of flow we have.